it's not just to live. It's mainly so I can be walking and talking and talking to my kids and my grandkids. So I want to actually have a very good life. It's not just about let's get to the hundred mark and then call it quits. I think sleep's always going to be a big factor here yeah. because I mean, if you bring it back to just metabolics in general, you know, our body's ability to utilize fuel appropriately is hugely distorted by a lack of sleep. The ability to recognize and utilize fuel properly is a key part of metabolic function. And yeah. like when someone is metabolically dysfunctional, their ability to utilize fuel properly, to sense fuel properly is disrupted. If you can squat your body weight, or if you can't squat your body weight yet, then you shouldn't even be supplementing. As far as cold exposure is concerned, there's not a lot of longevity literature to back it up. There's some metabolic literature that suggests like with rodents that it might improve uh, glucose uptake and things like that. But really the benefits are just coming down to this. This episode is brought to you by Element, my favorite electrolyte drink. Element has everything you need and nothing you don't. That means it's got plenty of electrolytes such as sodium, magnesium, and potassium in the correct ratios with no sugar. And you all know that electrolytes and hydration are absolutely key for mental health, physical health, and performance. Even a slight degree of dehydration can impair our ability to think or our energy levels and our physical performance to increase. So Element makes it easy to achieve proper hydration, and it does so by including three electrolytes in the exact ratios that they need to be present. So I drink Element first thing in the morning when I wake up. If I'm exercising, I will also have another one while I'm exercising. Now, many people are actually scared by the idea of ingesting sodium because obviously we don't want to consume a lot of sodium. However, I think that if people have normal blood pressure, and especially for people that are consuming very clean diets, then consuming this electrolyte drink is not going to be a problem. In fact, it's great tasting and it's super convenient. So if you want to try Element, you can go to drinkelement.com slash neuro to claim a free Element sample pack with your purchase. That's drinklmnt.com slash neuro. Tom, can I call you Tom? <laughs> I feel like we've got, we're there right now. Do you know what's so exciting? I have been watching you for so long and the fact that I'm actually here in LA interviewing you, it's actually really exciting to me. So welcome to the Neuro Experience. Yeah, thank you. It's awesome to be on. We have a lot to get through. Uh, I know that you speak a lot about, you know, you're in the health space, fitness, you look great. I want to touch on longevity more so, more than anything. We've started to interview a lot of guests around, you know, physicians, clinicians, scientists around this whole longevity field. And before we get into it, I want to know actually what your, you know, there's this aging theory that many people talk about. I want to know what your theory is on aging before we get into it. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because what is it? Aging has been officially classified as a disease, which is kind of odd, right? Because it's something that we all do. If I can be candid, I think we sometimes have a little bit of an obsession over aging and longevity because at the end of the day, it's something that's just going to happen to all of us. And I try to shift the paradigm in my own mind as like, how am I feeling today? How can I live today to the best of my ability and the most energy and the most abundance, the most vibrance and being present for my kids and my wife and just those that are around me, try to fill my life with as much like love and joy as I possibly can. And I think when it comes down to like the aspect of aging is so much less cellular than what we might think and much more driven by what's happening up here. So much that we can't put our finger on and maybe we're running ourselves into the ground, racking our brains, trying to figure out every little molecular nook and cranny that we need to. When in reality, if we just embraced relationships, embraced our sleep, had some fun, ate a cheap meal now and then enjoyed our life, you know, you know, you look at the guys like, uh, the crusty old man that drinks a six pack of beer or maybe a beer a day and smokes cigarettes and he lives to be 103 out in the middle of the Mojave Desert. You know, it's like, what's he doing right? I don't know. It's probably not the cigarettes, probably not the beer. Maybe it's going to the bar and hanging with his friends and having the social aspects. Maybe there's this way that we can triangulate this perfect storm of those things, right? Where you still get to enjoy your life, but you're not throwing it all in the wind and going out there. So 
my definition of aging and longevity is pretty loose. It's more so like if you're not living, you're dying, right? Mm. Yeah, you, you've definitely got that mix between life, you know, normal life, what our grandparents probably told us, but also the scientific realm. Yes. And you're right. I think we're, it's like this sickness. We're all obsessed with finding out how can we age backwards or how can we stop the aging process. And that, that's mainly because we now know that if you go and interview people who are, you know, maybe have a week to live, mostly all of them would say, you know, if they had one dream, it would be to live longer. So I think I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do in my own life is I'm trying to create the narrative of it's not so much the longevity aspect. It's more so I want to increase the health span. Like I want to, if I'm 80 and hopefully I'm going to live to 80 and maybe beyond, I have actually a, a goal to live to 100. And um, it's not just to live. It's mainly so I can be walking and talking and talking to my kids and my grandkids. So I want to actually have a very good life. It's not just about let's get to the 100 mark and then call it quits. So in order to do that, though, we have to be functioning well. So that's why I, I do obsess a little bit about, you know, I just had blood work taken, an extensive you know, I think there was like 80 biomarkers. I did my DNA. I even did my biological age test, which I think is a bit controversial as well. So I am doing everything I can, maintaining muscle mass and hopefully getting stronger as I get older. But so I want to talk about all of that. I want to get into the science of it, but I also want to remind people not to have focus too much on it. Well, you know, and your obsession with it is arguably a healthy obsession because you also enjoy it, right? Oh, I enjoy it So a lot. it's difficult. Like when we live in our echo chambers in the industry that we're in, like my wife will think I'm crazy sometimes because I'll do the same thing. I'll get 80, 100 biomarkers and I'll go get a DEXA and I'll do all this. And she'll be like, you're, you're driving yourself crazy doing that. I'm like, no, I actually thoroughly enjoy this. You know, you've got people like Brian Johnson, you know, that just are, are aiming to live forever. And people, people will criticize him day in and day out, but he's also doing what he really enjoys. So yeah. arguably he's getting a benefit out of it to a certain degree. Who knows? But I, I try to look at it the same way. It's like there's a very large difference between like an unhealthy obsession and a passion and a focus. I think the only part that becomes a bit uh, controversial with Brian is when he's getting uh, his blood drawn from his son and injecting it into himself. And, it's, you know, he's proven, actually he put yeah. a statement out saying it just proved to do nothing. Yep. So that's, I think, the ethical considerations around longevity oh, yeah. is what <laughs> creates the controversy. But, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, if he wants to do that with his money, he can. Exactly. Okay. So something I want to talk to you about is HDAC inhibition. And I want to talk about this as it relates to genes and epigenetics. So we have spoken a lot on the neuro experience around Alzheimer's disease and especially going and looking at your gene pool. So for example, we know that you have a higher susceptibility of getting Alzheimer's disease if you have one allele of the ApoE4 gene, or if you have two, it predisposes you even more. So we've spoken a lot about you have genes, okay? And I want everyone to you know, just listen to this. Yes, we have certain genes that can be responsible for these neurodegenerative diseases, but our epigenetics is actually what's driving the disease state. For example, if you think of a light switch, the gene being the light switch, you know, if we are sleep depriving ourselves or environmental factors, this can switch on these genes and accelerate um, us to these diseases, or it can switch it off. So what is HDAC? Begin with. Let's, let's back up for a second and think of, think of our gene pool and think of just epigenetics and DNA transcription factors, all this stuff. Think of it as sort of a, like a giant kitchen, okay, with lots of cabinets and, or even a locker room, just with lots of lockers. And in this locker room or in this kitchen, you can either have a wonderful person that's going to cook a lot of beautiful meals and do all these things with all the things that are in the kitchen, or you've got an angry troll that just wants to like destroy everything, right? So when you have your genes, you have your genes that are basically these various lockers, right? These various cabinets. And when you open up a cabinet or you open up a locker, you have the ability to express this gene. And I'm going to make this very colloquial. This is scientifically inaccurate, but let's say this you have athletic potential, just making it very general. Okay, you've been sedentary your whole life, so you've never really actually expressed any of those genes associated with that or like thereof. Okay, but then you start exercising and then you do express those genes and suddenly you start getting the benefits of it, right? 
but we have some genes that are just really locked away in cabinets that never really get accessed. And the downside is, is sometimes these genes can get accessed by this person that's going to do amazing things with them, and sometimes they can get accessed by things that aren't going to do amazing things with them, i.e. cancer, things like that, right? So genes are very, very, very complicated because it matters on what's being methylated, what's not being methylated, what's being acetylated, what's not being acetylated, and it gets into some fairly complex territory that's beyond my pay grade. But essentially, with HDAC, also known as histone deacetylase inhibition, you have compounds that are secreted from exercise or ingested or fermented, you know, butyrate, beta-hydroxybutyrate, you've got things. And what these do is they essentially, for lack of a better term, unlock some of these cabinets that might be locked. So in a healthy individual, you're going to have more of these cabinets unlocked anyway. So you have the ability, hypothetically, to live to a greater potential, for lack, again, lack of a better way of saying it. The healthier you are, arbitrary word, being healthy, you know, you can activate more of these, right? So if you're unhealthy, you're not exercising, you're not eating well, you're not getting the micronutrition that you need, then it can be harder to express these genes. So histone deacetylation is, like, if you imagine your DNA, your DNA is spooled up really, really tight. And it's estimated that if you were to extend one strand of DNA, it'd be between three and four feet. So very, very long with, you know, think of it almost like a, uh, like a, like a movie reel or a mm. roll of film. It's like it's rolled together and then it's like, whoop, 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 there's that entire gene. Okay, well, they're wrapped tightly around a protein. Okay, and this protein is called a histone. But essentially, you always have these little compounds that are floating around called deacetylase that's essentially keeping it from unwinding. It's keeping it from unwinding. Well, occasionally, you need to inhibit the deacetylase. So it's almost a double negative in the sense. So Histone deacetylase inhibition. Okay. We don't want to unwind it. Well, sometimes you do. And that's what's so difficult about genetics is you, you do want to unwind it because that's essentially how you actually express and activate that portion of the gene. So again, I'm gonna again, I'm not a genetic scientist. I know enough to be dangerous, but I can tell you that, like, again, as an example, let's say you have a gene that's associated with upregulating antioxidant activity in the body. Let's just talk about like maybe glutathione or something, something that's very good for detoxifying the body. And a simple thing that would activate that would be like stressful exercise, you know, where it's stressful enough on your body that stimulus and the response is, well, let's increase antioxidants potentially in the body to counteract the oxidative stress that came from the workout. If you did not express the genes associated with glutathione or superoxide dismutase, exercise would essentially kill you because it would make you such a toxic cesspool of oxidative stress yeah. that you'd fall apart. So there's also times when you don't want them expressed. Like we might have, you know, things laying dormant that we don't want to express. Or another example is, you know, we encode for just about every single, you know, type of protein and fiber in our body. So you wouldn't necessarily want to encode or express for a liver cell in a brain cell. You know, so that's when it's like really important to keep it under lock and key. So that's where like the proper understanding within the body of knowing when to express and when not to express it just the more you learn at this the more you realize like holy crap this is so insanely intense like and we don't know anything you know like the fact that our body is a beautiful orchestra that can understand like when to express and when not to express when to activate and when not to activate you know and some of the most like profound literature when you look at it like comes down to like higher fiber diets you know like producing more butyrate. There is a really cool study that was published in Aging in 2021 that was, I found very fascinating. I did a video on it a couple of years ago. And then when I was prepping a little bit for this, I came across it again. And I was like, forgot how cool it was. Essentially, they put people on a, like a lower carb Mediterranean style diet. So it was like high polyphenols, high amounts of fiber, moderate amounts of lean meats. You know, it was just like a, a good amount of olive oil and healthy fats. So it was just essentially that quintessential low carb Mediterranean. And they found that when they put them on this, along with a few other supplements like quercetin and some of these other uh, flavonoids, they were able to reduce or reverse their epigenetic age by two years with just a matter of, I, I might butcher it, but I, think, I want to say it was like 12 weeks or something like that. So essentially being able to like shift the diet and go into this micronutrient rich diet, it had this epigenetic impact where it did actually reverse their age. And it probably has to do with the polyphenols and the butyrate being produced as a result of fiber. 
So we do have some pretty profound literature that suggests, hey, like the quality of your nutrition can make a difference, but it's really quite holistic because when you look at histone deacetylase inhibition, like exercise is a really strong driver of that, of being able to produce more HDAG inhibition. Wow. And what about sleep? Well, I think sleep's always going to be a big factor here yeah. because, I mean, if you bring it back to just m metabolics in general, you know, our body's ability to utilize fuel appropriately is hugely distorted by a lack of sleep. So when it comes down to fuel regulation, a lot of these senses, these things that are being expressed or not expressed, that also comes down to nutrient sensing, right? So this is me talking, not necessarily the scientific literature, but I've always kind of speculated that when you look at the ability to recognize and utilize fuel properly is a key part of metabolic function. And like when someone is metabolically dysfunctional, their ability to utilize fuel properly, to sense fuel properly is disrupted. And that is a huge driver for what expresses genes. Like if your body thinks that there's an abundance of fuel or thinks that there's not enough fuel, you're going to express in a different capacity. Now, as far as like sleep is concerned, like sleep is a big lever that you can pull for your body to recognize fuel appropriately. And you see this with the glucose research, like subjects that are put under, you know, four and a half or five and a half hours of sleep compared to eight, just in one to three nights of sleep can have hugely impaired glucose tolerance, meaning that their body thinks that, or it's unable to utilize fuels properly, which could activate or elevate, you know, an AMPK state at the wrong time or a finely tuned mechanism. And, you know, without saying too much to dig myself in a hole with that in a world I don't know too much about, you know, sleep as far as longevity is concerned, I think is probably one of the most important and if not the most important, at least in the top two. It's interesting because everything you're describing now, everything we know about longevity science, whether it's fasting, well, you know, whether it's sleep, micronutrients, then does it all become about what we're really doing is trying to inhibit HDAC? I think HDAC is one part of it because okay. when you come down to it, like you've got HDAC, you've got you know, the methylation side too, which mm. again, it gets kind of muddy, but you have one side where you're trying to, you know, methylate or demethylate DNA. Then you've got one side where you're trying to acetylate or deacetylate, which is the HDAC side. And then as far as I know, you know, there's probably a bunch of other ones that activate genes or don't activate genes. And yeah, it comes down to a quote unquote healthy lifestyle. But if you like, where's the sexiness in talking about that, right? Like it's not, it's not fun to say like, okay, well go to bed early, get up, you know, at an appropriate time, you know, eat a micronutrient rich diet and, uh, and exercise, you know, cause that's all the stuff that we've been talking about as good and quintessentially healthy for the last 30, 40 years. People want something a little bit more, I don't know, like exciting to talk about. Yeah. yeah. So when you start looking at this, you look at, okay, it's a good segue into talking about like hormetic stressors and like we live in that world right where we type like what can we do to inflict just enough stress upon ourselves that we get stronger because it's not about trying to live in a super posh state where we're preserving everything you know if we talk about even uh you know people that are trying to live forever or as long as possible by essentially pharmaceutically babying themselves like for every time that you baby yourself in one category, you end up creating more stress in another category. Absolutely. Because you borrow from Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. I think, um, you know, we're going to get into hormetic stresses, but I think when we're looking at this HDAC inhibition, it all just comes down to then what you said, sleeping well, eating micro, micronutrient-rich diet, hydrating. And I, I would probably strongly correlate this to um, sunlight as well. Definitely. Sunlight, yeah. sunlight plays a big role. And then there's interesting bodies of research talking about ketones themselves, mm -hmm. right? Like ketones actually being a potent HDAC inhibitor. Like that's, I have done videos on that in the past where the presence of ketones, but it doesn't necessarily come down to like, oh, everyone needs to go eat bacon and cheese into a ketogenic diet. I think it comes down to the appropriate periods of time without food the appropriate periods of time with food right so you know if you look ancestrally like we probably did have pretty distinct periods of ketosis it probably would happen naturally whether it was through fasting or through periods of time when maybe you weren't getting enough carbohydrates to the diet because 
maybe you got a kill and that's it. And that's what you lived off of for a while. You know, and it would make sense that that would express an entirely different category of things, right? You're in a time of potential famine, like where like, your body's like, uh oh, we need to become more efficient in these categories. And a lot of the genes that are expressed when subjects are in a ketogenic state or a fasting state have to do with mitochondrial biogenesis. They have like, things like PGC1A or PPR alpha, like where you're basically activating transcription factors that are associated with fatty acid metabolism, which that sounds great from a body composition perspective, because what I mean by that is, okay, yeah, great. You're utilizing fats as fuel. That's great. Yeah, we're all going to get six packs, whatever. But in reality, from a survival aspect, the body's just doing what it needs to do. Like, why would it be upregulating or increasing or activating genes associated with glucose metabolism when there's not a whole lot of glucose at that point in time? Yeah. So it's going to upregulate. So then it begs the question, like, okay, well, what's better? Is fatty acid oxidation or glycolysis, you know, anaerobic glycolysis better for longevity? Both. The answer is just yes. <laughs> yes, both. It's, you know, what's, uh, what's fascinating is that in the last week I've done three different in interviews and it's been around longevity. And it just keeps, you know, sometimes I can only imagine what, you know, people who are not in science and in medicine probably think because one aspect, you know, I'm talking about metabolic dysfunction being at the root, root cause of many disease states and including longevity if you call it a disease. But then, you know, I've, I've had somebody else on a week ago where we spoke about NAD and, you know, the loss of NAD function as we get older is like, you know, something that is not providing the cell with energy. Therefore, um, it comes from a cellular perspective of aging. And now we're going into HDAC inhibition, which is more of a genetic approach to aging. It's like, Jesus. Yeah, there's so many different approaches, right? Yeah. It's, and who knows what else is going to come out, right? It's like there's the bioenergetics, there's the mitochondrial side, there's the genetic side. You know, I would argue that the genetic side is probably what we know the least about. Yeah. But it's also the most uh, in control that we don't have control over. You know, it's like we're predisposed. Like we have our genetics, right? Like what we're born with, like what is going to happen in time. You know, you look at twins and they've got essentially the same DNA, right? But then you've got epigenetics, which it's... I find it fascinating because it's like, these are different levers that you can pull. And generally speaking, the biggest levers that you can pull are literally the biggest levers you can pull. So it's like, I don't think that, although I am a huge fan of fasting, I don't think that fasting daily or something is going, that's a pretty small lever in the grand scheme of things. Whereas a big lifestyle change is the biggest lever that you're going to pull. It's going to have the biggest impact. And I don't think it takes a, you know, a rocket scientist to figure that out. It's just the most difficult to really wrap our heads around as far as like, well, how much should I do? And, you know, again, it's not sexy to do. It's not sexy to say like, hey, establish a good exercise regime and yeah. train your VO2 max and this and that. Yeah. I think um, also a, a lot of the studies have been done. I, you know, I have to play the gender card here because I don't think fasting is probably the best mechanism for women during different stages yeah. you know of the month and uh, many many of the studies you know women are unrepresented in in science so i think that that's that gets a lot of um, misrepresentation but you mentioned hormesis before and hormetic stresses now something that i think is prevalent is people moving away from the biggest levers which is sleep sunlight nutrition and exercise not getting that down packed and going straight to the cold bath or going straight to the sauna. And I have a very strong philosophy and it's like, can you even, if you can squat your body weight or if you can't squat your body weight yet, then you shouldn't even be supplementing. You know, supplements should be, the, should be at the top of the tier along with all of these really fancy, you know, red light therapy, all of these, unless you've got your sleep dialed in, your exercise dialed in um, and nutrition dialed in, what's the point of going through and doing these accessory items? So. I want to talk about what hormesis is and some of the different things that you implement to basically, you know, achieve a hormetic response. Yeah. I might steal that, by the way, about the squatting your body weight thing, because I think that's really important. Like you've got a large amount of people that are, you know, living in their mo mother's basement, you know, not able to like not wanting to work out, not wanting to work, not wanting to do anything for themselves, but they're taking five minute cold showers because you know what I mean? It's like, okay, like you're putting the cart before the horse. Like this isn't going to save your life. Like doing this cold shower might be a catalyst for something, 
or taking these supplements might you know, help you X, Y, Z. But I think you need to get your priorities in order first and do the big things that are difficult. You need to exercise, you need to get a job, you know, things like that before you start saying like, well, I want to increase my brain performance. Okay, well, let's, let's work on these things yeah. first. But with hormesis, like it sounds like it's such a simple concept on the surface and it is, right? It's just, you know, allowing, you know, creating a stressor or applying a stressor enough to the point where you develop a little bit of resiliency for it. But it's not as black and white as that makes it seem either, right? You have this thing called the hormetic curve, which again, I am not a subject matter expert in this. I'm more of a, a generalist that's just kind of hopelessly my own N of one. But, you know, a, a hormetic curve is essentially where, you know, you apply a stressor, a stressor, a stressor, a stressor until you get the maximum benefit. But then if you look at the hormetic curve, it sh drops sharply, right? So like essentially, like once you have gotten to a point of extreme stress, you get that point of extreme stress. And that is where people that are athletes take a little help, right? Like that's when supplementation can come into play because yes, it can change that hormetic curve a little bit more to where you can handle more stress and essentially get a bigger adaptation. Like you look at performance enhancing drugs, if you look at steroids, that's exactly how they're working, right? They're enhancing your recovery. They're enhancing the ability to withstand more so you get a greater adaptation. So, but I encourage people to look at hormetic stressors at sort of a micro level, like because if you're paying attention to the different stressors you have in your life, you have your big grandiose hormetic stressor of life and inside that big hormetic curve you've got all these little hormetic curves that create that curve right and i'm using myself for as an example if i'm in marathon prep and i'm also lifting and i'm also raising two little kids and i also get in a fight with my wife and then i go jump in a cold plunge like that cold plunge might just tip me over the edge right so it's all about like balancing these stressors against one another and being able to know like, okay, what is too much? And sometimes we don't have anything arbitrary or like, like subjective rather to really show us like when we've gone too far. And if you're not careful, like you either overdo it or you pull levers and you stress yourself so much in categories that have a minimal impact. And at the end of the day, the stressors come back down to like, okay, how do I mildly stress myself with exercise? How do I mildly stress myself with a little caloric restriction here and there and rotate your stressors? Mildly, but, yeah, that's the word, yeah. Yes, mildly and rotating. You know, it's like we all go through blocks. Like I don't necessarily recommend, unless you're highly trained, going through a block of, you know, maybe a, a three-day fast and intense exercise. Like, yeah, I mean, you can do it and you might be fine, but is it optimal? Like, you know, as Brad Kearns would say, like, you know, you're not getting that benefit. So hormesis is just a really fragile concept because it can easily get broken and with too much data it 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 can be detrimental. Oh yeah. But how does it relate to longevity? Oh because if you think about it from the perspective of, you know, if it doesn't kill you makes you stronger, then that's what it comes down to, right? Survivability but, yeah, again. It's, you know, how do you get tougher? How do you get more resilient? So yeah. You've got the two sides of the coin, if you ever remember like the anti-fragile concept. Yeah. You know, where it's like, if you just become as tough as possible, you don't want to be fragile. And that goes deeper than just that on the surface. It's little things like even coming down to, you could back it up and say, okay, I don't want to obsess over my sleep patterns because if I obsess over my sleep patterns, I've basically in turn become fragile. When mm. in reality, logically, you're doing the opposite. You're trying to be not fragile. You're trying to be like, I want to get sleep and I want to be able to be prepared to take on the next day. But in an effort to do that, you've made yourself fragile because you're obsessing. So anti-fragile concept comes back to the super wide angle view of I don't give a shit. Yeah. But with I don't give a shit also comes I don't give a shit what I eat. So how can you balance that to say I don't give a shit, but I also care enough to nourish my body properly and to exercise? It's funny because we were talking offline about cold immersion. And we both have gone in at, you know, maybe 50 degrees. Oh, no, sorry much much less than that was it 41 degrees and we just we just kept staying in like for me and I stayed in for probably five minutes and it took me around two or three hours to warm up and I actually got sick from it and that's going above that bell curve right yep. because I got excited <laughs> and that could have been a different situation if uh you know all the cards were stacked in your favor that day right like if you were maybe uh you, you we, we can look at our devices until we're blue in the face, but we don't necessarily know like what our whoop and our aura 
we just don't know where we are in that stage of recovery sometimes. And it's about giving yourself just enough, right? The saying, the dose makes the poison. It's like if you give someone a little bit of medicine because they need it because they're sick, that small amount of medicine is going to have an entirely different impact than a large amount of medicine. It's going to even have potentially different mechanisms of action in the body, you know, depending on the dosage. And the same kind of happens with a hormetic stressor, right? It's like, okay, if I'm jumping in this cold plunge because I want to get a little bit of resilience out of it and I want to create a little bit more brown fat activation and possibly some beijing of white fat, cool. Okay, but am I trying to completely fry my CNS you know, and make it so that then I can't move the next day or I can't perform as well because my body's in this heightened inflammatory state. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's a fine line, right? But I think it's, it's very important to understand what you're doing too much of and what you're do not doing enough of. And unfortunately, we're now living in a world where many people are getting their prescriptions or their scientific information from Instagram. And we're seeing people just doing crazy things. Like, do I think it's absolutely necessary to jump into a, a freezing cold bath every day. And by the way, I'm not talking about the, uh, the cold bath that I have at home. I'm talking about even colder than that. I'm seeing people get into like rivers. Uh, I, can, I don't even know. What do you think that the temperature would be in that? Oh, I mean, it's got to be low 30s. Exactly. Yeah. And if it's, I mean, if it's flowing, it could even be colder because, you know, ice isn't going to form as much. So who knows? Yeah, absolutely. Do I think that that is absolutely necessary to live a long and healthy life. No, for me, I think the biggest lever of hormetic stress would come from exercise. You know? Speaking of that, I know you've mentioned FOXO3. I want to go into that concept of what it is and how it relates to longevity because I've heard Rhonda Patrick speak about it a lot, but I'd love to understand what that is yeah, first and foremost. I first learned about FOXO3 from the perspective of fasting. Yeah, I was a big fan of fasting. I still am but again, the dose makes the poison. Right? Mm. I feel like there's, so FOXO3 can be thought of as sort of your stress response, like at a cellular level. Like if I were to get stressed, mainly I'll talk about it from the sense of like nutrient deprivation. So there was actually an interesting study in the Asian Journal of Andrology, and it was a rodent model study, but it was really interesting. And it demonstrates that with FOXO3, when you are, when you calorically deprive anything, but in this case rodents, it increased this thing called FOXO3. Okay. When you, and, and then they would get a life extension benefit. It improved the longevity of the mice via caloric restriction, which is somewhat known. Nothing's absolute, but we tend to see that caloric restriction tends to lead to improved lifespan, at least in rodents, right? But what was interesting is when they knocked out FOXO3, which means they made it eliminated so it couldn't activate that transcription factor. When they put these mice on a calorically restricted diet, they did not get the longevity benefit, which indicates that at least as far as caloric restriction is concerned, FOXO3 is a very important step. Very, and what ultimately it does that kind of gives you an indicator of what this big thing is, is what is called a transcription factor, which travels to the nucleus of a cell and essentially triggers a cascade of different changes in gene expression from there. So it's basically like this little messenger that goes in and from there it activates all kinds of different genes. Now when you're talking about FOXO3, the genes it's typically activating are related to endogenous antioxidant production. So you're usually looking at the ability to neutralize free radicals. So it's a very critical component to just the response. So if I were to go exercise and I were to strain really hard and have a hard workout and create a lot of oxidative stress, well, what is triggering the body to combat that oxidative stress? Because it, again, it's one of those things where if we didn't have FOXO3 or we didn't have some of these other FOXOs or to a certain degree sirtuins, like if we exercised intensely, it would kill us. Yeah. It would like we, because exercise is a rather toxic thing as far as the body's concerned. You create a lot of cellular damage, a lot of oxidative stress. And what's beautiful about it is the adaptation is what's happening cellularly. It's like, oh wait, well, we got to get stronger because this guy's messing with his body. He's doing the stressful stuff. He's creating oxidative stress. Well, I thought oxidative stress was bad. I thought we were always trying to neutralize it. Well, yes, we're trying to increase it, neutralize it, increase it, neutralize it. FOXO3 says, hey, like I just got activated because this guy's stressing me out. Let's go ahead and let's start increasing these endogenous antioxidants to combat. So the more that that system is kind of flushed out, 
the more benefit you have. And you can activate this via different mechanisms. You activate it through nutrient deprivation, through caloric restriction, through fasting. But then it begs the question again, you're like, okay, well, is caloric restriction the answer for longevity? Define caloric restriction, because yeah. is it happening on a 24-hour scale? Like, I was just talking offline before we started filming. I was talking with, uh, with Matt, who works with me, and we were just like saying, like, like, what is the scale at which this matters? Like, when I don't know personally how long it takes of nutrient deprivation before FOXO3 is activated. Is it happening at the minute level, at the hour level? Like, arguably, we all end up at a rate of caloric restriction or nutrient deprivation at some point even if we're not necessarily in a net deficit at the end of a 24-hour period or a seven-day period or a 30-day period or a lifetime. Because if you say, hey, you have to be in a caloric deficit in order to live for a longer period of time. Well, who's the one that has the master clock and the master like, spreadsheet of my caloric intake for my entire life? So if I die at 102 years old and I say, yep, he died at 102 years old, he was in a caloric deficit. When? For 102 years? Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? It's, yeah. So it's really difficult to identify like when these proper stressors come in. But what we do seem to see with the literature is that FOXO3 is definitely like a very imperative step for the antioxidant effects within our body. I mean, we talked about Brian Johnson. I think he's now doing around 1,800 calories a day, or maybe he's doing 800 calories a day, which would, that would seem very, very small. But I know that he is getting into a calorie deficit per day. And there's been a lot of you know, it's, it's like it, there's been a lot of talk around is it the fact that you are just, you've got low body fat, you know, and that's what's a- affecting the, the longevity aspect of it? Is it the fact that you are just not, you know, you're inhibiting mTOR? Is it like it's got so many different aspects to it, like this calorie restriction, and then it's time restricted feeding, and then it's do I fast until midday? There's just so many different things involved. But I think it does come down to if you are just in a calorie deficit yeah. per day. That's, it can be at any time. Yeah, exactly. Like when, when do you dip your toe in the caloric deficit pool, right? Yeah. It's, and there was a cool study that was published in uh, Helion that looked at like intermittent fasting versus prolonged fasting versus control. And what I found particularly, and this wasn't even the highlight of this study, but what I found interesting about it was like when they looked at intermittent fasting versus prolonged fasting, intermittent fasting being like just daily caloric restrict or not even caloric restriction, daily time restricted feeding, right? So where you're essentially just... I think they were in a mild deficit, but for the most part, they were still eating every day and it was just in a confined block compared to like multi-day fasts. And this was done with white rabbits and it was interesting. I know it's, you know, still animal data, but a lot of stuff, you can't put humans in a metabolic ward and look at this stuff. So sometimes we have to say, hey, you know, we're okay with looking at this rodent model or animal data to at least get our minds inquiring on different things. But what was very interesting was that the intermittent fasting group, but not the prolonged fasting group, had a higher levels of FOXO3 and ultimately higher, two and a half levels, two and a half X higher, and also had higher levels of downstream antioxidants, whereas the prolonged fasting group had lower, which is interesting because it makes you think, well, wait a minute, well, wouldn't it be the opposite? Exactly. Wouldn't prolonged fasting have this effect? And if you look further at the data, you see like, okay, well, IGF-1 was highly suppressed. So IGF-1 being a growth factor, it, it, gr- this growth factor seems to have some interlay with FOXO3, probably. I'm sure there is if you pulled data on it. But IGF is also important for survivability of our cells. Growth. We need growth, too. We need insulin. We need mTOR. So at what point do you inhibit so much of these growth factors that you actually do more damage than you did good? Yeah. Right? So it was very interesting. It was like, ah, okay, so periodic caloric restriction while still having appropriate calories in the right amount of time for that window of time in that snapshot of time would be beneficial for this FOXO3. But when you start pushing it too long, then it becomes problematic. So it's very interesting. Isn't that what Peter Atia does like once, once a month or once every three months or something? He does like a 72 hour fast. I don't think he's even doing that anymore because I asked him about that on my channel uh, about like his take on fasting. And I think he occasionally will time restrict feed, like he'll just you know, occasionally block his feedings. But he's not even doing prolonged fasting anymore. He's t- pretty heavy on like a, I want to build muscle while I can yeah. mode, which I personally think that it's easy to, I, well, you being a brain coach, like you get this. I think we always find the path of least resistance. So I feel like a lot of times subject matter experts will tend to like get going on one thing. Like right now, it's all about resistance training. Like everyone's talking about resistance training. And you can take one look at me and know that I like resistance training. But I also think that a lot of times, like 
people like to find something, hang their hat on it, and then just like get going on that because then it becomes mentally difficult to switch gears and like think about the cardio. It's really hard. Like I'll speak for myself. It's very difficult for me to think about putting my best foot forward in resistance training while also simultaneously putting my best foot forward at achieving my VO2 max because I do know that VO2 max is the single largest predictive indicator of like a long healthy life, right? Mm -hmm. Like VO, having a high VO2 max is the largest thing that you can see in terms of like, uh, you know, all cause mortality, like yeah. basically, uh, you know, if low VO2 max is a very high risk factor. So I'm like, okay, that's clearly important. However, on that same side of the coin, you see muscle mass is yeah. clearly important, right? Well, strength. So, so you need to treat them yeah. both as if they're very important, but it's so difficult because people say, well, I need to put on muscle because that's going to be the most important thing. And I'm not saying that Peter's doing that and, you know, not focusing on his cardio, but I know his mode right now is like, you know, at his age, he's like, I have a finite amount of time left that I can put muscle on. So I'm going to be okay with gaining some body fat. I'm going to be okay with doing this in the effort of putting on muscle, right? So where Peter is with his life, he's like, I don't know if fasting is the best place right now. I don't know. I don't know if it works for me right now because I am in hardcore, like get my mTOR spikes, get my insulin spike and put some muscle on. Whereas me, I have muscle mass that's on me already. I feel like I'm in a great spot where like I can leverage caloric restriction a little bit more flexibly. Although I have to be careful that I don't fast too much and lose too much body fat and have it become dangerous that way. Yeah. Well, you said muscle mass, but I think when it comes to longevity, I think it's, it's also strength yes. and not muscle mass. But we know that muscle mass is uh, amazing. The uh, you know, storage and glucose storage, I should say, and mitochondrial biogenesis, which we all want and all need. However, I think strength is more correlated. Yeah. In, yeah especially grip aspect. strength. And yeah. Yeah. It's, I love that you bring up your, your, your interview with Peter because I, I watched it as well. And I don't know what bucket you sit in when it comes to nutrition. Are you a, a plant-based? Are you a 70% plant-based and 30% carnivore? Like, what I, do you <laughs> I consider myself just a good old-fashioned omnivore. Yeah, um, me too. You know, I would say like my diet looks predominantly, you know, meat, fruit, cruciferous vegetables, a little bit of raw dairy. Um, you know, I would say I would eat a Mediterranean diet that's probably about one and a half to two times the amount of meat in a typical Mediterranean diet. So, yeah. And that's just because of my, my athletics and what I do. Yeah, I often, um, I can't right now, you know, you can, when, it, when you're, I know a lot of people in, the, in this space of longevity who are trying to live the best life, the most healthiest life, and there are people who are just so against meat. Yeah. Okay. Where do you sit? Like, okay, my, a better question would be, why are you not plant-based? Because I feel like protein quality matters. Okay. I, if you're accounting for muscle mass, strength, and longevity. Yeah. yeah. For the, I mean, especially, okay, especially for me personally, the amount of muscle mass that I carry, the sheer amount of carbohydrates that I feel like I would have to consume to get adequate amounts of protein for me would be far more than I would want to consume. I consider myself a relatively low-carb guy. I thrive on a moderately low carb diet, like under maybe 120 grams of carbs per day. But I also feel like when you truly look at the protein digestibility and dispensable score, amino acid score, and you look at the PDCAA, and you truly look at the numbers, and you can't deny the literature that in a non-truncated form, and you look at like go, being able to go over 100, like animal-based proteins are higher quality and are more bioavailable. And the next best one that's plant-based is going to be soy, which I really don't have a problem with. I've done a full circle on soy. Like, I think if you can get good quality soy, like, it's probably not a huge problem unless you're really overdoing it. But, you know, soy is like somewhere in the 90s on the DIAAS score, whereas like whole milk powder or say like eggs or pork are 130, 140, which means they're literally going over 100% bioavailability as measured coming out of the ileum. So when you look at amino acid availability, I'm like, how do I get the most bang for the buck? But I'm also not going to lie. Like, I like eating meat. It yeah. feels good to me. I feel good on it. And you're definitely up to date with your lipid profile. So why not? Yeah, so I, I think that's the biggest reason, right? People are like, well, I'm trying to limit my saturated fat. Yeah. My total cholesterol is 140. Like, I mean, it's like super low. And yeah. like, it's when you look at meat in general, also just things like taurine, things like creatine. Like, I don't want to take a lot of supplements. I mean, I do take creatine and I do recently started taking taurine, but like, that's like, we're going to get those from meat, period. 
So it's like when you start looking at, and I'm not an animal based guy. And like, that's the thing is like, I fully respect and appreciate people that are plant based. I just think that you might have to like plug a few holes in your rowboat if like, you're plant based. Like, I got to plug this hole because I need creatine. I got to plug this hole because I need some taurine. I got to plug this hole because I need more B12. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, even the ALA. Yeah, like, yeah. The more that I feel you have to start plugging holes, that as far as my brain efficiency, that just kills me. Like, I want to focus on my life. I want to focus on living a vibrant life, enjoying my family, enjoying my kids. And I don't want to have to take B12 or have to take creatine because my performance is going to decline or my brain's going to decline, right? Like, it just doesn't make logical sense to me. However, I fully support many of the arguments from the plant based community. We diverge on the protein discussion to a degree, only on the protein source. When I t- talk to Simon Hill, like, we both agree that having high amounts of protein is great. High amounts of protein is the literal only thing that we disagree on as far as the plant-based community is the source of protein. I'm a huge proponent of fiber. I'm a huge proponent of flax. I'm a huge proponent of polyphenols. I'm a huge proponent of vegetables. So I'm definitely not an animal-based guy. I just feel like we truly should be eating omnivorously. But again, that's just me. Yeah, I have a post going out probably some t- sometime today or tomorrow, and it's that I actually generally feel sorry for the population of people who think that plants are going to kill them. Yeah, it's a, it's a wild world we live in. And uh, that's why I'm so happy that you said that. Okay, I want to go into now heat therapy because I know that you've done a lot of it. And do you have an, uh, do you have an infrared sauna? I have a dry heat sauna. Like the, so I use the full blood, full, full bore, like fully leaded heat sauna, not an infrared. So. Okay, I want to talk about why you use it and what are some of the things that come about, you know, these heat shock proteins. Yeah. What are they doing? So, I mean... Rhonda Patrick would be the, the perfect person to talk to him with that. She's, she knows that. You know, do you know her lo- number? Um, I do. I'd love to have her on the podcast. I do. <laughs> I do. I'm actually uh, supposed to go down to San Diego to have her on the channel in September. Okay. Uh, yeah, she's an awesome person. She truly is, uh, you know, side note, like everything that she comes across, like people will be like, like oh, she's got to be reading from a prompter because she's so like, she's so, no, that's just her. She is like, I've talked to her on the phone. And she's just like, Boom. Yeah. She's, she knows her stuff. So I first found out that I really liked saunas when uh, it was more exercise performance related. I noticed before even looking at literature, like when I would sit in a sauna, and I always liked it. Like I, I'm a firm believer that we have people like heat tolerant and cool tolerant. Like people, there's some people that really like the cold stuff. Like I feel like I could sit in a high heat sauna and just endure. Like I just feel like I do really good. Uh, but I was finding that I was really improving my lifts. I was improving my running performance. I was improving my sleep. So I always knew that there was some literature out there, you know, especially as far as longevity is concerned and as far as like cardiovascular risk. But for me, like I got into it for the performance aspect, you know, it was like that massive, massive like angiogenesis that can occur basically by just sitting in a sauna and an exercise mimetic. So I look at that, I'm like, to me, the biggest benefit of a sauna is the fact that you're mimicking exercise. Mm. In a yeah. passive way. From a cardiovascular perspective. From a cardiovascular, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're definitely not. Well, you, you could make the argument that like, you do get some level of myokines being secreted. Um, but for the most part, yeah, it's from a cardiovascular benefit. Uh, also became very interested, something we talked about when you came on my channel, was the glymphatic effect. So mm-hmm. by increasing the intracranial pressure by going in a sauna when you create high heat, because a lot of times the only way that you're going to increase that in- intracranial pressure is by the glial cells doing their magic, right? So like if you can artificially or I guess kind of artificially, create more intracranial pressure by being in high heat, then it makes that glymphatic system and that brainwashing effect more effective at night. Yeah. So for me, uh, it improved my sleep dramatically. And as someone that kind of suffered from insomnia after my first kid was born, it just disrupted my sleep so much. Getting up when he was colicky, I never really bounced back from that. Like, so saunas have just been another, I guess I could call it a Band-Aid, but it's more than a Band-Aid. It's something that's part of my weird little arsenal to help me sleep. But then you start looking at the literature and you're like, okay, this makes sense. Like as far as cold exposure is concerned, there's not a lot of longevity literature to back it up. There's some metabolic literature that suggests like with rodents that it might improve uh, glucose uptake and things like that. But really the benefits are just coming down to this. With sauna, you know, you've got the large scale, you've got the, the, the Finnish study, the big JMA study that was looking at sudden cardiac death. And huge improvements. Like when you look at just going from one day per week to two to three days per week of sauna was like a 22% less risk of sudden cardiac death. 
And then it goes even more beyond that. When you start going to four to seven, it's like 60% plus reduction in sudden cardiac death. Now, when you look at the fact that cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular death is a big reason why people die, especially in the United States, I say, okay, like if I can just reduce my risk there, that's one less thing for me to worry about, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm all about efficiency once again. How do I just focus on the things that I love and where the biggest levers that I can pull? I don't want to worry about having a heart attack. I don't have time for that shit. Mm -hmm. So I just would rather say, okay, sauna is great for that. Uh, And then when you start looking at heat shock proteins and that, it's again, it's what's called a chaperoning protein. So a heat shock protein, just like the name implies, it's basically helping escort the proper like folding and unfolding and preventing the misfolding of various proteins of you know, organelles and, and cells. So essentially, when you're looking at uh, if you exercise or the faster that you move, the more you move, the more cellular transactions that you have, you're essentially having multiple periods of folding and unfolding and like when cells and proteins are forming. Essentially, what sitting in a sauna does is by increasing these the heat, heat shock proteins, it's allocating resources to make sure that cells are rebuilding properly. And that's a pretty potent thing to do. And again, when you look at the mechanistic data, it's pretty darn strong. So I see a million different reasons why to do it. But for me, it's like, okay, there's a growth hormone effect. There's an IGF effect. There is an athletic or, or exercise mimetic effect. I feel like there's a recovery aspect. You know, for me, like I've never gotten good circulation to my lower body, like beneath my knees. Like I've always like, it's just been a problem for me, like ever since I was a kid. So like, I noticed that like, if I put my feet up in a sauna, I can get blood flow into my legs and it's just better for recovery. Mm. What's your protocol? Because I actually am, I'm not a proponent of hot and cold. I don't think that there, I don't think you need to be doing sauna, jumping into the ice bath, going into the sauna. I think that you should separate the two. Yeah, I think that they are two completely different modalities yeah. altogether. And I don't think like going from hypothermic to hyperthermic That's, is a very good thing. So I live part of the time up in uh, Lake Tahoe, right? And they say like five to eight people per year die from cold shock jumping into that cold water because the water is glacier water. So it can sometimes be 50, 60 degrees outside and then really, really cold water where you're breaking ice to go in. And people jump in the lake and they get cold shock. It's just like our, we're not designed to do that, like clearly. So I do think that going from hot to cold, although that seems to be like what a lot of people like to do, is probably not the best. Like you're going from hyperthermic to hypothermic. And again, I don't have data to back it up other than like literally people dying, like jumping in cold lakes and doing polar plunges. That's like the ultimate hormetic stressor. Let's just go until we die. And if we come back from the dead, then, we can, you know, yeah. like, so I posted something a while back where it was, I had my cold plunge in Tahoe, which I only went in for a few minutes, but it had a thin layer of ice. So I did break the ice. So it was very cold. And then I immediately went in the sauna and I just got like hung out to dry by people like you're eliminating the entire brown fat benefit. Like you're supposed to get in the cold plunge and then just like, you know, like, or you're supposed to go sauna first, then cold plunge and then just warm up naturally. I'm like, okay. I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but like I'm 5% body fat. Like if I don't go jump in that sauna, like I'm going to be shivering for three hours and it doesn't matter what order you do it in. Like that was purely for me to warm up, you know, and like get warm. It was either that or jump in a hot bath or something. And they are two different stressors with two completely different systems. And I think people block them because uh, like for so many years, like the NFL and professional sports have like touted contrast therapy. But contrast therapy is a different ballgame. Contrast therapy is for uh, blood flow and inflammation reduction. Blood flow, inflammation reduction. And if you're doing it for that reason, there is a purpose behind it. But they're doing much more like moderately warm baths and moderately cold plunges and going back and forth for short amounts of time, sometimes for hours. It's different than, you know, Bob Smith that's just trying to like, you know, I think people do it to consolidate time. But yeah, I would, if I had it my way, I would cold plunge in the morning and I'd sauna before bed. Yeah, me too. And I, I'm generally, I don't have a, a sauna. I, I have one in my place in Sydney. And I'm generally doing that because it helps me so much with my sleep. But I'm doing it at around 40 minutes. But it's different. It's an infrared sauna. Yeah. Yeah, infrared, you got to sit in a little bit longer. You have to stay in a bit longer. Sometimes like 45 minutes because you've got to heat up. It takes a while to heat up. Yeah, definitely. You're kind of, for lack of a better term, cooking yourself from the inside. And you don't, you know, so like you'll sweat faster but you don't get that heat shock protein effect until you're sitting in there for a little bit longer. Yeah. And then I wanted to understand what your actual protocol is. Are you doing 20 minutes, uh, 
in yours like three times a week? Yeah. So I did jerry rig mine to get up to 230 degrees. <laughs> so, oh my God. Yeah. So um, I'm a big proponent of personally, you know, like, yeah, full disclaimer, like not everyone should do that. Like I'm, I've built up a tolerance to it. And if you look at a lot of the Finnish saunas and like in Sweden, they, they crank them up really, really hot. Like they do get them really hot. In the United States, a lot of the saunas are capped out where they won't get higher than 190, sometimes 200. So, you know, I've rigged mine. I probably publicly won't say how, but it's really easy. People did want to look it up. And if you contact the manufacturer, sometimes they'll tell you if they're out of the U.S. But anyway, so mine gets really hot. So I'll do 20 minutes and I'll do, I'll usually set a timer for 20 minutes. I'll go in there and I'll meditate. And the reason that I meditate in there is because I get pretty squirmy and want to get out, right? And because it's hot and I'm trying to tolerate it. And I'm pretty good judging like knowing when it's going too far. Like I can tell if it's too much, but it's uncomfortable and you want to move around. And I like to do like my non-reactivity drills there where I just like will sit and I'll meditate and I'll try to resist the urge to scratch my face or do anything, just like build focus even under duress. Um, So that's what my protocol is like. And I don't say I do it a specific number of days per week. I would say a minimum two, Uh, you know, if I'm out of town, I can't get one, you know, whatever, then I'll take a hot bath because People say that hot water immersion oh, yeah. can work really, really well too. Yeah. You know, there again, I'd have to look at the literature, but it seemed to be split both ways. Like, I don't think that men are going to make themselves go sterile if they're like in a hot bath for 10 minutes, you know, unless it's like piping, 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 like unbearably hot. But I mean, there is that kind of myth. It is a, a myth, but it's also got some truth to it. Yeah. Uh, but if I had a perfect situation, I would say like four days per week, I would sauna. I think you're going to live to like 140. Probably not. <laughs> okay, so last, my, my last question would be around something that not many people know too much about. You know, we, we've heard cold baths, we've heard saunas. Like, what is something that you think, and we know exercise, is there anything outside of that that you think people should be ingesting or doing to help increase their health span and lifespan? Okay. If this was YouTube, I wouldn't say this. But I think that sex is really important. I think that biologically it's like the taboo piece right it's like the, it's not taboo but we don't talk about it like i don't know like i think as long as you are able to procreate and as long as you are pushing that kind of forward from a, at least a male perspective there's got to be something that also has some driving force there and you look at like uh couples that have stayed together for a very long time and like remain sexually active even when they're older like their health like they're vibrant people. I don't have literature in front of me to say that they're like you know, healthier people, but this is just going into blue sky territory where it's like, maybe we aren't looking at this enough. Maybe being like sexually active is a component of also like the relationship piece that's so important. Because we have established that relationships, when you look at the blue zones, you look at things like that, uh, you know, very, very important. Seems well, the to study be- that we brought up on your channel, the 80 years uh, Harvard study. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like just having social interaction that just makes you feel safe. It's important. Well, where do you draw the line with like, like sex as well? Again, it's not an area that I'm an expert in, but I just think like, okay, this is a category that I haven't seen people talk about. Mm. And like, how important is true intimacy? And if even not sex, actual and just intimacy independent of sex. You know, obviously the goal isn't necessarily to procreate when you're in your 70s, but is there some biological feedback that says like, hey, like, no, there's importance here. Mm. but also oxytocin, also all these other neurochemicals that come as a result of intimacy, all these other peptide hormones, peptide bonds that are, are broken, created when that happens. Who knows? It's, again, not my category, but I think it needs to be looked at. more. You know what I was just thinking about? You know, um, so I live in New York and um, some of the biggest people on TikTok are walking around Central Park or, or the West Village and they're interviewing people on like, hey, you know, how much do you pay a month? in rent, things like that. I was just thinking, imagine somebody walking up to like 70 year olds and hey, do you guys still have sex every day? Like, well, what's, it would be absolutely hilarious. That would be great. I might um, do that. That was awesome. So (laughs) tell uh, tell us where you, we can find out more information about you. Uh, It's usually more so uh, where people can get away from me. But uh, the most important thing to note is I am not V-Shred, even though it's the guy that runs ads that looks kind of like me, but people always confuse us. I'm not V-Shred. <laughs> really? Yeah. What's, I didn't even know V-Shred. V- V-Shred's like a, uh, he just runs ads. Like he's- That's all he does. Like, yeah, like massive YouTube ads, but it's kind of like, it's very like- He looks like you? Questionable. Yes, he looks like me. I don't look like okay. him. He looks like me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but like they, they run ads over my videos all the time because he looks enough like me that like, he kind of like could 
oh, piggyback wow. off my credibility. So all, all the time, people hit my inbox being like, hey, I bought your workout program. I don't sell workout programs. <laughs> anyway, so, so I'm definitely not V-Shred, but most of the time you can find me on YouTube or you find me on Instagram at Thomas DeLauer. Thomas DeLauer, thank you so much for being part of the Neuro Experience podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me.